Okay, uh, let's uh, uh, start. And then, uh, yesterday, uh, we start to talk about uh, fusion category, uh, maybe bridge fusion category, or quantum dimension, those kind of uh, things, uh, fancy abstract mathematical stuff. And but why we want to do that? Uh, because uh, we want to study a uh, Hamiltonian with some kind of ground states. But this ground state have some entanglement structure, so called long ring entanglement. And we try to measure this uh, entanglement structure, try to probe those entanglement structure. And it's kind of like we have, we have a crystal. We want to measure crystal structure. We do X-ray scattering. But suppose we do not have X-ray scatter. We don't have X-ray. So how do we measure crystal structure? So one way to do so is to consider dislocation of some other defect in a crystal. Then all those uh, defect and their property uh, uh, can be used to measure crystal, crystal structure. So actually, this is kind of interesting question. I don't know whether how much people study that. We just pretend we don't have a, a X-ray and how to use a defect and what property defect should you use so that we can fully characterize the crystal and the space group? So that's kind of interesting question. And here we are doing similar thing. We want to study the entanglement structure, but how to describe entanglement structure quantitatively? So it seems uh, difficult. And here we study defect, means that we, we study punctures created by the traps and uh, then study the property of those uh, punctures. Okay. Then, then here we try to describe what kind of property we want to uh, study. Uh, the one property is this equivalence class. How many different equivalence class do we have? Means how many different type of a puncture can we have? Certain different type is uh, is defined by this uh, uh by by adiabatic change this uh this trap. If a two trap uh, can be changed to each other without closing energy gap, we say these two traps are equivalent. The equivalent class of a trap define the uh, part particle type. And uh, how many type, how many equivalent class of trap, that's already a very important data for entanglement. And, uh, and then we can study the fusion. Uh, when the, when you when you view two trap as one trap, you know uh, how this equivalent class uh, merge. You know, so we have this a uh, uh, fusion uh, fusion ring uh, with NIJK describing this uh, fusion ring. Then that's another uh, data uh, to describe the entanglement structure. And uh, then from this uh, NIJK this uh, fusion coefficient, uh, we can compute the so-called internal degree freedom for each uh, excitation of quasi particle. And that's give us concept of quantum dimension. So slowly we, uh, we're using some physical uh, measurement of physical uh, tools to extract some data. And those data actually is a fusion category or module tensor category. So those data form those uh, uh, categories. And uh, so this may be the most mathematical part of this uh, uh, talk. It's a sequence of talk. So actually, uh, not only we have this uh, uh, fusion ring, NIJK, we also have this so-called F symbol. Actually, we kind of, we, we know about F symbol uh, in, the, in the group theory. We can fuse uh, two, uh, two group representation into some other representation. And then, but however, when you have a, three representation i, j, k to fuse together into representation l. Then there's an order. We can fuse uh, j, k first or first i, j first. And uh, then when fusing this a different order, the decomposition uh, have some relation. And this relation between these two different uh, way to fuse or to decompose is called the 6J symbol. And uh, remember that's a, uh, our particle, you know, the fusion space is given by those particle I, I, I. So you can view this like a, it's like a, then we try to view this fusion space as an individual vector space tensor together. It's in a sense, uh, we try to 
we try to think the each particle have internal degree freedom, and this internal degree freedom is like a vector space, just like a group representation. The vector space tensor product two vector space, you get a, a tensor product of group representation. You always try to think this way, even though this vector space don't even have integer dimension. Okay, but you can still think that way and formally, and that's what a mathematician do. And uh, so. So therefore, this stick J symbol can be defined formally, even without a, uh, without a knowing or seeing internal uh, vector or vector space. We just formally have something we call vector space. So this uh, IJK can be thought as a, some formal vector space. It have internal degree freedom layered, labeled by the quantum dimension. You know. Okay. So, so maybe just a, just, just a. a uh, one extend one line. So suppose we have I J K. That's a that's a trap of quasi particle fused with some other things to get some fusion space. So this V just a, is a grounded subspace with many many traps. Okay. However, if we we try to bring I J close together, like uh, in this case, uh, if you bring I J close together, then this uh the degeneracy. So this uh, this big bar is uh, this uh, V. Uh, may split into uh, into some uh, subspace. So this subspace is really this uh, labeled by M. But also, but uh, but for the same M, there may be M may appear several times. So we have alpha, alpha label. If M appears several times, then this, this different time uh, uh, again labeled by alpha. So several copy of uh, this M subspace uh, then labeled by alpha. So therefore, this original space. Can be written as direct sum of a uh, some smaller space. Uh, this this smaller space is just uh, this uh, this smaller bar here. And then we can, uh, then we can fuse this combination IJ combination which became M fuse M with the K. Then each one, so this one do not split, but this one split, and the last one also split. You know, you know. Then we get a further, a uh, smaller, even smaller space. So basically, is that this original vector space can be decomposed into direct sum of those smaller space, and this can decomposition very much like choice the basis vector. The basis vector can be viewed as a one-dimensional vector space, and the choosing a basis vector is basically right a vector space as a direct sum of a several one-dimensional vector space. So we view this uh, choosing basis vector is really choosing the decomposition. Choosing a direct sum decomposition. So therefore, this this order of fusion gave us a particular direct sum decomposition of a, of the original big vector space. That's a grounded subspace. Then certainly we can do another fusion. We can do fuse JK first and the I with a N later. Then then it give us another direct sum decomposition of the same vector space. So therefore, these two direct sum decomposition, like choosing these two different bases, and they are related by uh, uh, by a unit transformation. And this unit transformation is this F symbol. So basically, so the formula is that uh, this uh, this uh, this particular basis vector can be viewed written as a superposition of some other basis vector. So that's a that's a the way I look at it. So therefore, actually, this F symbol is there. You know, uh, it's it's. It's kind of tricky to to see is is there, but the uh, fusion ring is easy to see. It's a uh, physically more transparent, but F symbol is a uh, is a uh, is a more shuttle, but it's there is an uh, important data. Okay, and uh, this F symbol is a uh, is is some matrix. So basically, this matrix label the I J K L, and the index matrix this is a row index, this is a column index. So there are three indexes. Uh, Combination describe row and column basically, and and this one is a unitary matrix, and then and the F symbol cannot be arbitrary unitary matrix. There's a there's a there's a very famous constraint called the pentagon identity. That is when you try to fusing four particles, then from from this wave of fusion to that wave of fusion, there are two different paths. Uh, uh, what I try to say is that uh, uh, this order fusion and, and that order fusion also related by a unitary matrix. 
But this, this big unit tree matrix can be viewed as a composition of a F symbol, which is smaller unit tree matrix. It's really just like that. So you can see to, to go from here to here, we can we can we can we can fuse the uh let me see. Okay, yeah, we can change we can switch the fusion order. So here the K fuse first with this uh uh with M here, but then we choose to switch order, we say K fuse with L first. So from here to here, they differ by the F matrix because the, the order of a fusion K is, a, is a changed. And that's related to the F, F matrix. So basically, I'm really using this graph. So this graph and this graph are related by this F matrix. Yeah, the changing basis. And uh, then, then we can bring, then the, the I, J fuse is I first here. Then we say J fuels with a uh, uh, with a Q uh, first. Again, the switching order. Element so that's just another F matrix. Yes. Element two question: What is will? What is alpha? Greek letter symbol. Oh, that's a that's a degeneracy. Uh, uh, yeah, I can see here we have alpha beta. You see, where's alpha beta come from? This M N is just a I J fuels into M or J K fuels into N. But what is alpha? Alpha appear here. You know. Here we have IJ fusion to M, but M may appear several times. That is correspond to the situation where this uh, uh where this IJ fusion to K1, K2, K3, etc. But maybe K1 equal to K2 is the same same type. So this this K1 may appear twice. Then you have N, N I J K, that's K, the N would be two. So when you're writing on the direct sum, the k would appear twice. Yeah, and uh, uh, so here's the same thing. You know, if uh, if uh, n i j m is more than one, the alpha would have a range from one to this value. That means that this m appears several times. And we we put that index of how many times m appear at this vertex. So i j fusion to m, but so m may appear several times. This alpha may have a range. If m always appear once, I mean n i j m equal to zero or one, then we don't need this index at the vertex. Yeah, that's a simpler, and uh, but uh, in general, we 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 somehow need this index. So can I ask the follow? Yeah. Just, so. So script V is the is the fundamental mathematical object and everything else. If you if you know V, then everything else can be extracted from it, like these numbers. Exactly. And, 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 no. So yeah, yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. So since we have this question, so let me we can just go here. So the ground state subspace of a trap is this uh, uh script V. It's a it's something is a something accessible physically. And that's correspond to infusion category is a home space from IJ to identity to trivial. So this is the physics. You know, physics only this home space is accessible. <laughs> and then we try to construct this uh, everything else from this home space. You, in Euro mathematical theory, the home space is, uh, is, is not that all they, they have other things beginning. Then at the end, you get you get, it has a home space. So this is an interesting way to look at the fusion category or tensor category. That's a, if only home space is a physical measurable, then we define out the concept category from the home space. So actually this, what, what I'm trying to do here is, uh, is just like that. And uh, similarly, uh, we can go from here to here uh, in different order, we can we can switch in the J first. So the J first to the J first field to the right, or uh, left, and then then we put field to the right. Then we can switch in this uh this uh, T uh then and etc. Then here, but uh, we have need to take three steps. So we have a three F symbol to go from here to here. But the first way, first path is a two step two F symbol. So this is just a two different way to express. The same uh, unitary relation between this choice the basis and that choice basis. So we should get the same results. So that's a huge equivalence relation. That's a, a constraint. 
Now, so this F symbol should satisfy this uh, uh, panic uh, identity. This nonlinear algebraic equation. And that's almost it. You know, that's how I view module or uh, fusion category. Fusion category is described by data N I J K and F F symbol. And uh, N I J K satisfy uh satisfy this kind of a, a condition and the F symbol satisfy this uh, panic identity. There's a few other not so important relation. And solving those, we get a, a so-called allowed legal uh, data. And that is a fusion category. So that's a kind of computer way, computer understood the way to define a uh, fusion category. But in my, in my book, uh, the fusion category defined in the totally, in a much more abstract uh, uh, fashion. Uh, the here is a, is a one poor man's way to do so. Yes. This is elementary. Is this pentagon identity different from associativity in group? It is associativity. Exactly. We can say it looks like uh, not three. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, it is also the, the F symbol is associator. You can see we, we fuse IJ first or fuse JK first and they are related. It's kind of associator. It's all related to associativity. And this panel then thing is consistency condition on the associator. What is the corresponding quantity in group theory? Group theory with group theory F symbol or... is a six J symbol. I see. Yeah. So actually, in group theory, people compute a six J symbol, and then uh, in, because in, in group theory we know this uh, V, this vector space, uh, this I J K are just vector space, and uh, and we we know when the fields we know how how they uh, how they how they how they are related. So we, we compute the CJ symbol. Then we find that the CJ symbol have this property. So therefore, the appending identity is a property of CJ symbol. And now we turn things around. We say, we don't have a vector space. We don't know how to <laughs> do this uh, CJ symbol. But we're using padding identity as a defining property. That's defined, uh, uh, defined uh, fusion formally. Even though without vector space, we can define fusion formally. And so this is a, this is what you need to have a formal fusion. Yeah. Uh, so in known examples, so do you really solve this uh, pentagon equation or you just calculate them from the, uh, I mean, the uh, V <laughs> alpha? So yeah, which one is correct? You ask very well, uh, good questions. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's making me like doing all this for nothing. So yeah, this is a theory you set up, but uh, at the moment it's only useless. <laughs> we cannot solve it. You know, it's a you know it's just a nonlinear algebraic equation. We just uh, do it, even for simplest case, sim because you can see how many labels we have. This I F symbol have a uh, ten labels. If each label have a range two, that would be one thousand unknown. And then this equation also have a lot of free index. And uh, in the, if you each now have a range of two, maybe the 10,000 equation. So there are 10,000 nonlinear algebraic equation with a 1,000 unknown. It's already determined. Even for the simple case, and uh, almost impossible. So, so there's a big industry, as I like now, is also the try to find a, uh, fusion category without solving this equation. Uh, so like using group theory or some quantum double, uh, a quantum group. And, uh, uh, you know, there's all kind of, uh, uh, uh reputation. Okay. Reputation of how far algebra, you know, so there's all kind of way, uh, one try to, uh, try, try to solve this without, without solving it. Just, but by, by construction for that one. But we really wish there's a way to, to direct solve it in a you know, classification. Because it's very hard to solve this. So we don't have a classification of this uh, fusion category. Yeah, there's a, uh, there's upper bound. Uh, so for, for every, you know, this rank, rank means uh, how many uh, particle, uh, how many type of particle do you have? The upper bound go, you know, <laughs> it's a very bad bound. It's a, it's, 
if uh, if you know it's billion trillion or billion of a billion, you know, this this kind of you know, for small rank. Yeah. But it's uh yeah. Uh, however, uh, uh however things are getting better if you for the for the modern diffusion category. Fusion category is is a, is a lot of headache. Okay. So okay, so uh so what? And uh, so here I want to say that uh, this F symbol actually define uh, a theory for one dimensional excitation. Okay. Uh, it's a little surprising why I call this because uh, the way we do it is uh, even though the picture we, I draw is a uh, is you can see is on the I mean, on any space, but uh, when we actually compute and uh, we we can put those extensions on the line and we do not switch their order. So all this calculation is done without switching their order. So therefore, so this calculation works at the for one D, certainly also works for a higher dimension. But in higher dimension, we have more structures. There's a more structure because the particle, you can, you can switch the order, you can break. But in one dimension, we cannot break. We can fuse, we can do fusion. And the fusion without the switching order. And actually, this is exactly what we, we did we did so far. It's a fusion without switching order, all kind of thing. So therefore, this theory describes excitation any dimension, including one dimension. But however, in higher dimension, we have a more data, more things. But in one dimension, that's all. Yeah. In one dimension, that's all the data. So this is why I say this kind of fusion category theory is actually a theory to describe one dimensional extension. And I hope including all the data for the one dimensional representation is a complete description of a one dimensional right, uh, extension. No additional data is needed. Okay. So this became really exciting. That is, uh, uh, we have a mathematically consistent theory for one dimensional extension. Then physically, it's also, can we design the Hamiltonian in one D lattice model? Who's uh, who is have a gap ground states and whose extension happened to be uh, uh reproduce this uh, uh uh fusion category? Then we really have a, a story, yeah. So uh, almost like uh, this, uh, this this uh, this extension is highly non-trivial. It's kind of like anya in one dimension or some topological in one dimension. Do we have that? Then you may say, well. We talk about this uh, one dimension topology order since uh, we conclude that uh, there's no non trivial topology order in one dimension. So, what's going on here? So, uh, yeah, so before uh, maybe just hear that, uh, before I go into that, maybe just uh, mention that, uh, yeah. Uh, so, the, this uh, fusion space is a ground state subspace, is a, is a fusion space in a, in a category theory. And there's a lot of uh, correspondence, I just say, this. Uh, in category theory, we have an object, we have a morphine spinning object, we have a simple object, it's composite object, and uh, there's a fusion ring and the quantum dimension, and et cetera. And they all, here we just all have correspondence. The object actually is a trap. Object is delta H, but however, it's the equivalent class of delta H to be more precise. Okay. And, uh, and then this, uh, the morphism is really our unit transformation, which you can, um, maybe this unit transformation means like a a a, a, a debatic change of delta h. We are changing delta h adiabatically. You know the 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 this uh, ground state subspace uh, rotates really by the unitary matrix, and this unitary matrix is is a morphism. You know, it's like an operator act on the topological extension, local operator act on topological extension, and uh, <clears throat> if this is trap. If ground subspace is stable against the perturbation, this is called a simple object. And uh, the bound state of excitation is a fusion, you know, things like that. So therefore, uh, therefore, this uh, the notion in the category theory can be or produced by, by this uh, set physical setting. Yeah, that, that's a that's a message. And then, then we say that uh, the, the unit fusion category classified the allowed one-dimensional topological excitation. Okay, but whether they class a one dimensional topology order, and says no. <laughs> the the problem is falling. Uh, if this fusion category is non-trivial, 
is not realizable. Only trivial fusion category is realizable. Non-trivial is not realizable. So, uh, so it's a uh, again like we 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 try very hard and we get nothing. It's, it, so, so somehow mathematics allow this kind of structure for one dimensional particle. But the mathematics allow the structure cannot be realized by physics. It's a little bit surprising because we thought if something allowed, it should be realizable. Yeah. And uh, so, so, so therefore, this uh, we can imagine the fusion category is like a quantum field theory. It's a de de describe a low energy effective theory. It's like quantum field theory. So basically, here we say that the fusion category is not realizable. Like to say, the quantum field theory have no UV completion. Yeah, yeah, using a lot of that language, and uh, so. Uh, so this abstraction to find the lattice realization of quantum field theory or anything or module tensor category is called a gravitational anomaly. Yeah, this is another definition of a gravitational anomaly. Usually the gravitational anomaly is defined as a uh, as an abstraction to go from classical theory to quantum theory through path integral because the path integral measure is not deformorphic invariant. And here uh, we define gravitational anomaly not as abstraction to go from classical to quantum theory, but as a property of a quantum theory itself. And uh, then, then we say that uh, there's a there's a low energy effective quantum field theory which uh, with, which do not have any uh, UV lattice uh, realization. And this property is called a gravitational anomaly. And maybe we should call this a different name. But, uh, but actually these two parts are very close related. So we can call the same name, but definitions are very, very different. Yes. When you define local lattice model, do you mean that the, any interaction should be on-site? Short range interaction, not on-site. Not on-site. Yeah, short range. Short range is not Short range, has, yeah, so find the range. Oh, only for yeah. one. Okay. Uh, interaction has finite range. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for any finite range, you can say it's local lattice model. Yes. Okay. Yeah, local lattice model means you find a range. Okay. To be safe, we don't include the algebraic tail. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But th that's be kind of shuttle thing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And uh, so, uh, so in some sense, uh, we say that uh, uh, the unitary fusion category as a one plus one D quantum theory is uh, anomalous. So it's not real level, it's an anomalous. Okay. Um question? Yeah, please. So so your local lattice model, does it include the anion chain, like the uh power fermion chain or like uh Yeah, thank you. Uh, no. Uh this uh, lattice model is uh you know, when I say lattice model, we have this uh, definition of a uh, uh, there's a vector space per site, and total vector space is a product of the tensor product of those small vector space. I see. I so, see. so this, uh, so, so the, the, yeah, lattice model have that uh, more, more precise definition. Basically, the total Hilbert space have a tensor product decomposition, and each uh, lattice site have a small vector space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a define. Uh, that's how we define the lattice model. <laughs> you don't allow the like infinite dimensional local Hilbert space either. That is a really interesting question. Yeah, at the moment, no. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. But but uh, but uh, when you allow infinite dimensional uh, unsight hyperspace, it may become more powerful. But how much powerful? Yeah, that I don't know. Yeah, that that be really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but here the lattice model, the uh, unsight hyperspace is finite dimensional. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. So that's uh, that's how 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 we define this. Okay. And. Uh, yeah, on the yeah. previous page, so speaking, I don't have any. I think I did understand. So, do we, so why this one D theory has such an anomaly? Can I have some some picture? Uh, well, it's it's falling. Let's use you know field theory. When you write down the continuum field theory, actually the continuum field theory can be more flexible 
uh, allow more things. And then uh, you can write down the very ordinary looking continuous field theory. But then you realize that this continuous field theory cannot be realized by lattice model. Like when you have chiral fermion theory, then there's no lattice description uh, to realization for the chiral fermion theory. But uh, as a continuum field theory, it's uh, okay. So what I try to say is that uh, sometimes when you write down the microscopic low energy factor theory, this the consistent condition is more relaxed. We can write down seemingly consistent theory in a more flexible way. But uh, but uh, but writing down those uh, reasonable theory may not mean it's realizable by lattice or by some UV completion. So this uh, this is this is a typical uh, 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 tension from continuum to UV completion, and this uh, this this uh, this mismatch from continuum consistent theory to consistent lattice UV completion. This mismatch is called anomaly. And this image must exist. That the here just say this exists. So you can see what we did here is that we using some macroscopic consideration, define a self-consistent theory for one-dimensional excitations. It's like a defining a field theory uh, in the long distance. And then we ask the next question: Is this a self-consistent field theory are really consistent for at the lattice scale? The answer is no. I, I can I cannot yeah I I don't know how to say more than that. <laughs> it has nothing to do with some lattice space space group blah blah. No, uh, we have no space uh, here. We we have a lattice I mean, model. On the, yeah, on the lattice. So when when continuum field theory try to put such field theory on lattice, so sometimes we should consider some lattice space group blah blah. But this has nothing to do with that kind of no yeah. Um, yeah, it's a it's not it's not it's not really a symmetry. We don't need a symmetry. The lattice can be random lattice, random ground. Any simple example to you? Hmm? Example for this? Do you have any? Um. Uh, okay. Uh. If it yeah, takes some time. Yeah, you don't have. To. Yeah, I have. I have example. Maybe uh, I have example later. Just uh, maybe let me let me just discuss some example later. Yeah. Can, can I just, sorry, one more question. Yeah. So the, the, the Haldane spin one chain, this doesn't, you wouldn't classify this as a topological phase. No, it's not topological phase. It have a symmetry. I see. You know, so far we, there's no symmetry. There's no global symmetry. When I say lattice model, we don't need a symmetry. And in this, uh, uh, in the trap Hamiltonian, no symmetry. So, uh, so this uh, spin one chain, uh, if you don't have symmetry, that's a trivial phase. Yeah, it's a belong to a trivial product phase. So, so if I if I think about SPTs, you definitely do have one dimension. For no, no, for SPT, they always have symmetry. If you don't yeah. have symmetry, sure. there's no SPT. So here we have no symmetry, so there's not even F, uh, SPT. So yeah, that's what I meant. If I if I if I sharpen this to think of the cases where I do think about, you do have symmetry. Yeah, then you have something. Then you have yeah. plenty of one D. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. That exactly. Uh, actually, my example will be along this direction. <laughs> Thanks. When you add symmetry, there's a yeah. You you start to have something. Yeah. Yeah. So so is it a possibility to realize non-trivial UFC on the boundary of I mean, yeah? Yeah, that's the next 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 slide. So, yeah. <laughs> So, so I try to explain anomaly from more general. You know why why this theory have anomaly? The anomaly and there's and related to this uh, principle of remote detectability. So, uh, so it's really the following. You may think a solid harm uh, in field theory. There's two type of solid harm. One type of solid harm can be detected at infinity. We don't need to go close to solid harm. I study far away from solid time, we can detect that. Like a multiple or vortex, uh, we can detect that. And there is another solid time, like in non linear model, you can map space uh, with non trivial homotopy group, wrap, wrap the target space. That solid time is really local. You know, from, from infinity, we have no sign of that solid time. And uh, so, this topological station we talk about is kind of like a solid time, like a like topological thing. But uh, this belongs to the first type. I mean, like multiple or vortex, and they should be detectable at infinity. 
And uh, uh, the reason is that uh, if a solid time cannot be detected infinity, like uh, you will just wrap space locally uh, to some uh, uh, target space, because we don't we don't have a, we have a lattice model. There's no continuity. So this uh, this this kind of solid time, although we call topological, it has non-trivial wrapping. Once you have a lattice, you can always break the break continuity and un unwrap it. So that solid time is like a local can be created by local operators, and uh, only when you have a non-trivial structure at infinity, you 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 have this non-trivial particle uh, topologic station. So that's really this is really trying to say that the uh uh somehow there's another requirement I didn't put put, put in that is a uh, the topologic station should be detectable remotely. You know, in a reasonable realization, this topological station should be detectable remo remotely. And uh, if that happens, it can be realized by lattice. If not, then it's not realizable by lattice. So in a sense, uh, we can say that uh, one way to probe in remote is like a braiding. You have particle, and you have another particle is a detector. Then you braid around the first particle, you see the phase of this mutual statistic is like a remote detector, like detecting the uh, magnetic flux of, of vorticity, and this, to say, yeah, this uh, this is a topologic solid time, which have non-trivial structure at infinity. But in one dimension, we cannot do braiding, so there's no room to do braiding. Okay, so therefore, this topological thing in one dimension, uh, they they are they they, they, they are not uh, detectable. Uh, remotely, there's no such a remote detector. So, so this is the reason that uh, in higher dimension, because we have braiding, this particle non-trivial particle station is a uh, is a uh, is a uh, is a uh, consistent. But in one dimension, whenever we have a non-trivial particle station, uh, uh, is then it's not remotely detect detectable. It means uh, 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 anomalous. So basically, say remote remotely detectable. And anomaly free, which have to say this is the same thing. And uh, if the topological system can all be remotely detected, then it's realizable by lattice. Otherwise, it cannot be realized by lattice. Yeah. So is it true for the only the gravitational anomaly, or I mean, does it include the other kinds of anomaly? Uh, at the moment, we don't have any symmetry. Mm -hmm. So with that's only for gravitational okay. anomaly. Okay. And when you have a symmetry, uh, this thing uh is no longer true. Yeah. Yeah, this is only for gravitational anomaly. The symmetry is uh, different. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so this, uh, so so this is a kind of a, a more physical reason to say why why one dimensional fusion category is uh, kind of anomalous. It's not realizable. It do not exist. Why we talk about it? Then it's uh, it's this. It is consistent. It must exist. <laughs> so you know, I always say it's not exist, but <laughs> it must exist. But in some way, exactly uh, what you mentioned, is a is a is really a boundary. You know, uh, it turns out that this uh, 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 even though it's not realizable by one dimensional system, but realizable as a two dimensional or two plus d uh, lattice model with energy gap, because uh, the fusion category is a low energy theory. If your ball has very large energy gap in boundary, you don't see them. So, uh, so you're, you're, it's okay to attach a box with a very large energy gap. It's very much an anomaly inflow. I mean, once, you re, once you say this one dimensional fusion kind is anomalous, then it's very nice to think, oh, well, normal inflow, there should be non trivial box. And this non trivial box is really the uh, topological uh, order, uh, box topological order. So, so actually, there is a, a so if in one dimension is normally free, then the topological order in the box is trivial. Then you don't need the box. If you trivial topology order means the product states. The product states, you can remove the product states, then you, you don't need the box. However, even though, however, if a topology order in the box is non-trivial, even though it have energy gap, you know, usually when something have energy gap, so, oh, we can throw them away. But because there's an intrinsic language entanglement, we cannot really throw them away. Then their boundary would have this uh, gravitational anomaly. And here I want to say that uh, uh, this gravitational anomaly is a generalized gravitational anomaly because of the, the gravitational anomaly people talk about usually means invertible one. And uh, 
However, the topology order in the box is usually is not invertible. And uh, so, so therefore, this uh, from this uh, bulk boundary relation, using this defined gravitational anomaly, the gra most gravitational anomaly are not invertible. So I'll come back to the invertible things uh, uh, later. Yeah. But uh, just, uh, just say this generalized uh, one. Okay. And uh, so, so therefore, uh, so therefore, this, uh, uh, so therefore, this uh, n dimensional anomaly and n plus one dimensional topology order are really uh, have this, uh, we try to say, have one to one correspondence. Actually, almost honestly, they are the same thing, basically. Yeah. And so, this is a kind of a, a classification of a gravitational anomaly because we, don't, we are not talking about a symmetry. Sorry. Yeah. It's, I, I, about this gravitational anomaly, is this. If I think of the continuum, is this is this just C left not being equal to C right, or is it more general? Much more general. So like the two thirds state has this anomaly. You know, any any two dimensional topology order is boundary would have that type of anomaly. Okay. Because of what you describe is a chiral center charge. Yes. It's just one feature, but there's a many many different topology orders, many different patterns. So any module tensor cardio is a is a uh, is a graphical anomaly in one lower dimension. But it, this would have something to do with whether or not you can locally gap the edge states. Is, is that the no? That's the one. Uh, yeah. Uh, so for, for 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 a lot of graphics, normally you can gap the boundary. You can gap the edge states. Yeah. There are certain uh, graphics anomaly. It's a. Uh, it's most. Yeah. It's a. It's more general. Yeah. It's a uh, more wild. Let me say. Yeah. You, 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 the boundary has to be gapless. Yeah. And. Uh, Okay, so that's a kind of a, a, a bigger picture now. Uh, and so let me just go quickly. That uh, is a uh, so so that's about one dimension. Two dimension, as I mentioned, uh, we can do braiding. And as a result, you know, fusion ring this n i j k n i j will be equal to n j i. You know, even before we don't we don't assume this uh, uh, they are symmetric. Even non symmetric is okay. But most solution is symmetric, but there are indeed non-symmetric solution. But in two dimension, i j j i is a same bound states, so this one is symmetric. And most importantly, you can braid. And the braiding related to R matrix is so. I'm not going to talk about R matrix. It became more more technical. But the only thing I want to talk about this one thing. Not the uh when you when you braid the twice. The R matrix describes half braiding, you just exchange. Uh, but if I J are different exchange, you know, get different, different configuration, is uh, you don't have definite phase. But if you if you braid it twice, it's like doing this uh, mutual statistic, you should get a phase. And uh, something easy to understand is that uh, this we got a theta I J. Theta I J just means the mutual statistic angle between I particle and the J particle. There's a little bit of tweet, twist. Usually when you say, uh, we have a we have two onions with a mutual statistics theta i j. That's it. But here, this i j may fuse into k, maybe several different k. It turns out that depending on fusion channel, this phase factor may be different. So that so this mutual statistics angle not only contain theta i j, also contain have a k dependence. And uh, and that's it. So, uh, so this, I think this, this is a good data. Yeah, it's easier to understand than R simple. <laughs> so, uh, uh, one can, uh, using this data to describe this, uh, mutual statistics, uh, uh, the, the, the braiding. Okay. Then, uh, then we include the braiding. Then these are three tensors. Now we have R tensor. Oh, this is theta IJK. Would define a so-called, uh, uh, unitary braid fusion category. And uh, they are theory for two dimensional excitation. So it's very similar. Then in three dimension, you can do similar thing. But in three dimension, there's more. You may have a string station. Yeah. And uh, then actually, there's one thing. In two dimension, we can have a string station. Why we only consider particle? Indeed, uh, we, we, in general, we should have string station. So the most general theory for two dimensional station, including both particle and the string. Here, I consider uh, some kind of uh, uh, a, a, a simp simplified one, but for the reason, because here we have more intention that we hope 
our theory are realizable by lattice. We have a string, the string cannot break, just like in one dimension, the particle cannot break. In two dimensional string cannot break, the co-dimensional one defect cannot break. So if you have a co-dimensional one defect, then they bound to be anomalous. So we, we so we remove string from beginning. And uh, once we have once we have string, it's anomalous, it's not realizable. But uh, without string, this kind of braid fusion category uh, uh, it, it may be realizable. So that's a question. Uh, uh, whether they 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 are realizable or not. Okay. Again, no. And uh, uh, so, uh, so we have the same issue. There's a braid fusion category describe a consistent uh, braiding and fusion of particles. But however, uh, but not all the braid fusion categories are realizable by, by lattice because of anomaly, same reason. And here we can describe anomaly more, uh, more easily. That is, uh, sometimes we have two, we have, we have particular particle. And this particle cannot be detected by braiding with any other particle. <laughs> if that happens, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's anomalous. It's, uh, so we have this uh, undetectable particle, this, this anomalous. So this, uh, this, this feature is called the degenerate. You know, if you have undetectable particles, this uh, diffusion category are called, called degenerate. If only trivial particle is undetectable, then uh, every other particle detectable is called non-degenerate. So that's a that's a mathematical uh, term uh, for this. So uh, so therefore, uh, remember we we described topology order using ST matrix. Uh, use if you know the S matrix, you can compute this uh, what is detectable, what is not detectable. But anyway, I won't I won't go into detail here. But uh, it's uh, uh, from here, we just want to say that some braid fusion category is detectable, some uh, anomalous, some is not. And the non degenerate one is called a modular tensor category. Okay. So braid fusion category is more general, it could be degenerate. And the modular tensor category is a subset of that. And uh, then it's a satisfies remote detectability, it's normally free. And uh, they, they are all realizable. The module tensor categories they are all realizable. At least that's a conjecture. We think they are all realizable. Yeah. Is there any issue the lattice model loses the locality? Hmm? Is there any issue if a lattice model loses the locality? Uh, if a lattice model loses the locality, there's a lot of issue because we don't have a dimension. We have a non-local interaction you can think you are thinking about zero dimensional system. So the property here depends on dimension a lot. And uh, so this is a local unitary, and this, uh, when you do braiding, there's a there's notion of doing things slowly. When particles are far apart, they all require this uh, locality. Yeah, without locality, it doesn't work. However, if you say interaction decay with certain large power, this may work, but that's a bit more detailed. Uh, thing. Yeah. Um, can I have, uh, can I ask a question? Um, yeah, so, please. So in the 1D models, you said Unterberg UFC cannot be realized. Um, and, uh, I, maybe it's a stupid and I think I misunderstood a little bit, but yeah. Uh, can you comment on the like Marana zero mode and the GitHub chain? Because it's, it's, it has a local space and local Hamiltonian, but it looks like I can still have some non trivial excitation. Uh, you mean, okay. The first that we talk about is a, is a bosonic system. We are not talking about the fermionic system here. A, that's very important. I and uh, both and fermion have a totally different uh, picture. Yeah, here yeah, then I'm, yeah. Then and, I'm uh, yeah, the Kitava chain, uh, you can map to bosonic system is a symmetry breaking state. So right. it's, a, it's a symmetry breaking, yeah. I see, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when you say realizable by a lattice model, you mean lattice model in the same dimension? In the same dimension, yes. Okay, but when the MTC has a central charge, isn't it's it's realizable. still realizable? Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, this is a very interesting question, yeah. And uh, when MTC have central charge, and the magnetic thing, thinker is not realizable. The physics thing is realizable. <laughs> 
uh, the difference is the following. Uh, when when MPs have a have another central charge, it's realizable by 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 model which we cannot solve exactly. And then we have some kind of hand waving way to solve that numerically, and uh, you know even with ten percent error bar, we it's uh, we think that's convincing enough to uh, so it's it's there. It's, uh, right, so but, it's, uh, but however, it's not rigorous. So we have a ten percent error bar. Probably it does not exist uh, from a mathematical point of view. Yeah. But there is no general construction like the Levin Lem. No. Model. Yeah. This uh, this is the commuting projection model always have a zero central charge. Right. Yeah. And uh, I think I don't know. There may be some kind of argument or proof that uh, the, uh, there is no commuting projector realization. Oh. I think that's almost mm -hmm. a proof. Yeah. Okay. And uh, then it became big big headache. You can propose the Latin model. You claim it's realized this particular MTC, yeah. but but it's far hard to confirm. Okay. Yeah, but it's, it's a, a case by case. Yeah, it's case yeah. by case. Okay. But we, we know we have a lot of examples like a quantum house states. Yeah. Uh, all games, right? So chain summon theory is MTC with non-trivial central charge. Right. And uh, but the, why quantum house states uh, describing this uh, chain summon theory? You know, uh, it's numerical evidence, but numerical evidence is only for for the system maybe be 20 electron. Okay. Yeah. The, by the way, the lattice model in that case would just be a lattice version of Chern Simons. Or that's also an interesting question. The the lattice version of Chern Simons theory is very hard to define. Right. <laughs> and, and also yeah. other for the good reason, because Chern Simons theory is a have kind of some charge. Right. A nice lattice model better to be commuting projector. Otherwise a mess, you know. Right. We still don't know what what, what to do with it. Okay, so we believe there should be a lattice model, but it's yeah, yeah, not yeah. clear. So the physics would believe for every MTC okay. there's a lattice model may not be right. that soluble right. uh, to realize that. Yeah. And for the particular, yeah, this is a very, very good question. For some particular uh, module tensor category, which allow gap the boundary. Okay. All right. Then there is yeah. a, this, uh, the gap the boundary are always described by unitary fusion category. Right. When you have a unitary fusion category, you can construct string net, and then there is a commuting projector realization of this uh, right. all MTC with the gap the boundary. Right, but but that that's equivalent to having vanishing central charge, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the, but but that also requires that the central charge vanishes. Yeah, that's where right. central right. charge happens. Yeah. Uh, sometimes, uh, even when central charge vanishes, a certain MTC don't have a gap boundary, and we have a, right, we right, have right. A similar yeah, we have yeah. similar. Oh, problems. then it's a, yeah, so yeah. It's really not the central charge, but have but it's a gap the boundary now. Yeah. So the non understanding is that the for all the MTC with a gap the boundary, there's a exact solid model to realize it. For those without the gap the boundary, we think there's a realizable, but uh, it's a that's a more physicist belief. Okay. Yeah. So here is some example. You know, the simplest anomalous uh, uh, braided, uh, unitary uh, braid diffusion category is this, have two particles, trivial particle and the E particle. Uh, the E particle have a fusion of uh, Z2 fusion. Z, e, e, e and E became trivial. And the quantum dimension of one and one, the topological spin is zero. They are both so carry no spins. Okay. And uh, uh, so, uh, and this one is anomalous because uh, you can see that uh, 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 for the for using actually if using topological spin, I think uh, you, we can construct the theta i j k. Theta i j k. If I remember correctly, something like that. So it's s i plus s j minus s k. Yeah. So if you know the topological spin, you can construct uh, uh, these uh, uh, these uh, these mutual statistics. And also, if you, uh, from topological spin, you also have a self statistics. You know, it's just a, uh, the self, there's, there's spin statistical theorem. Uh, there's a self statistic also described by spin. If spin could integer is a boson, half integer is a fermion, other spin is an onion, you know, uh, something like that. So therefore, uh, I just using topological spin to describe a self and a mutual statistics. And so that's a, so, so that's what I'm here. You, so if then this topological spin equal to zero, that means uh, uh, they have trivial mutual statistics so not remotely that the type of things like that. So what? But but you say this is realizable. You can say when you have a system with a Z two symmetry, this E is Z two charge. 
and uh, and uh, this 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 uh, this British Ocean card is really describing a system with a Z two symmetry. And E is topological in that sense. You cannot uh, uh, destroy E by Z two symmetric operator, but you can destroy using Z two symmetric breaking operator. <laughs> yeah. So so so, but we call this is anomalous because it's not realizable by lattice model without symmetry. Yeah, because for lattice model without symmetry, this is also very strange because lattice model with symmetry is a special case of a lattice model without symmetry. This sounds very strange. You say, we require symmetry, it's not, uh, it's realizable. We don't require symmetry, it's not realizable. But with the symmetry special case of <laughs> without symmetry is certainly realizable. The, def the problem is that the, the notion of a non-trivial extension, because non-trivial extension is defined as a equivalent class of a lot of perturbation. A lot of perturbation is changed. For model without symmetry, you have a large, you allow more perturbation, then you don't have two class, you don't have one class. Then for the model with the symmetry, then you do have two class, one and E, otherwise you don't have one class. Okay, so this is a, a this is reason. And actually, from here, actually, and that that part I'm going not. I plan to talk about, but sorry, I don't have time. That is from here, you can see that a uh, uh, anomalous uh, uh, ray diffusion category cannot be realized by the model without symmetry, but it can be realized by the model with symmetry. Means anomaly and symmetry almost like same thing. You know, if no anomaly. Then no symmetry. We don't have anomaly. Then you have symmetry. So this is a uh, so this is a quite an amazing connection. And then also can connect. You can even say that that's a main theme. Or just say that anomaly means a symmetry. No anomaly. No anomaly means no symmetry. But anomaly is a bulk. You know, we have anomaly means you have a non-trivial bulk. No anomaly means you have a trivial bulk. So suddenly you see that. With a no anomaly, no symmetry, trivial bulk. With anomaly, with a symmetry, non-trivial bulk. Well, bulk topology order is a symmetry. So that's a, also see the connection here. And actually later I'll, I'll describe this picture from other angle, but this is a main theme of a categorical symmetry or this holographic view of the of the symmetry. It's really like a symmetry, anomaly, and a bulk topology order are very, very close related. Almost they are the same thing. Yeah. That's a, that's, that's a, from here you can see this. So, so question, question, yeah. In, in, is this anomaly, is the diagonal anomaly in mapping class group in the yesterday or? Uh, no, no, uh, but, but, but I will talk about that uh, maybe tomorrow. Yeah, okay. so this anomaly and the mapping class group ST matrix have very close relation. That is a more quantitative description of anomaly. You know, at the moment we describe anomaly, it's just a little more handling abstract. So we have anomaly, no anomaly. But what is the quantitative description of anomaly? Then, then this uh, ST matrix and those kind of things would come into play. Yeah, because uh, let me, you can even say here, because uh, uh, we we start to have a quantitative description of topology order. This quantitative description of topology order actually is a quantitative description of anomaly, and also quantitative description of a symmetry. So they all now they all come together. Yeah. Okay. Then in some other case, like we have a model with a one s s is semion. The quantum dimension is one one. They are bosonic. Uh, they are abelian. Semion have a, a self uh, topology of quarter. The self statistics also the uh, uh, you know, I, and uh, this one, uh, Samyang can detect self. You know, we have Samyang, another Samyang go around it. You see a face, so this one is uh, anomaly free, and uh, and uh, another one have one the five, and this is called Fibonacci topology order, and uh, the quantum dimension is non is kind of a golden ratio, so it's a uh, uh, it's a non abelian. And then we have this uh, 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 double Fibonacci, uh, which is two of these together. This one is realizable. Uh, oh, sorry, this one have a commuting projection realization. 
This model have a non-zero central charge. So we believe have non-commuting for generalization, but uh, uh, how, yeah. And this uh, this one, the third one is a Tor code model. It's all Z2 gauge theory. Yeah. So so we have some example. And uh, then we'll, uh, we'll also discuss this uh, this S3 gauge theory. Yeah, S3 gauge theory uh, 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 have this data. So this, uh, this, uh, this one is a trivial extension have a quantum dimension one and topological in zero. This A1, remember S3 gate theory have a particles. The particles are labeled by the representation of S3 group. S3 group have a two representation, one dimension, sorry, two non-trivial one, a one dimension non-trivial one, and another is a two dimension non-trivial one. So this A1, A2 is a, is a gate charge in the one dimension representation for A1. A2 is a gate charge for the two dimension representation of uh, of this S3 gauge theory. And uh, so there's two dimensional representation, so therefore the quantum dimension is two. It's uh, very, very nice, yeah. But uh, then, then we have a B. B is a flux, because S3 gauge theory have this uh, gauge flux. In two dimensional space, flux actually is also particle. So B is another particle describing S3 flux. C is another flux, you know. And uh, the flux are labeled by conjugate class. S3 have a two non-trivial conjugate class. So there are two kinds of flux. And there's, we have other things, which is bound state of a charge and a flux. Okay, so total we have a, a type of a topological extension in S3 gauge theory. And uh, so here we list their dimension and the topological spin, quantum dimension topological spin. And this NIJK describes this fusion rule. Yeah, this this fusion rule is the NIJK describing the fusion rule. Okay, so this will give you some example, and this one also anomaly free. Uh, so uh, give you some some example of uh, uh, this. Uh. Okay, then whether MTC classify two dimensional topology because we now we say that every MTC is realizable. So then it looks like a, it's a complete theory for uh, for extension. If you know everything about the extension, know everything about the defect, then we should know bulk topology order. So we should we should say it's classified two-dimensional bosonic topology order. Still answer is no. The, but however, it's classified something like uh, the two-dimensional bosonic topology up to invertible topology order. <laughs> so there's an invertible topology order which cannot be seen by MTC. So what happens really following? The invertible topology order is a, is a very special topology order which don't have a non-trivial bulk excitation. All the bulk excitation are trivial. They say if it's extension trivial, they should be trivial. Well, it have a non-trivial boundary. So you can see that's the thing we, we missed here, yeah. We only consider point defect. Considering point defect only is not enough to do two-dimensional, to see two-dimensional topology order. This code dimension one boundary also some carry some information, not too much, a little bit of information. So that was missing by MTC. So, so the invertible topology order is the following thing. You know, we have a topology order, we have this, uh, the topology of the order form an abelian group. Well, it's not really group, so we call it abelian, a community of monoid, it means uh, there's a multiplication rule. So the multiplication of two topology order is just a stacking. Yeah, one, one system and another system stacking together give you a third system, just a stacking. So this is the multiplication of two topology order rule give you this uh, defined monoid. The reason is monoid because uh, sometimes we can have a topology order A. We can, we, we cannot find any other topology order such that the stacking give us a trivial topology order. <laughs> Means no inverse. So for the Fermion system, the famous uh, uh, invertible topology order is uh, for Fermanian one is an uh, integer quantum Hall states. And uh, uh, for fractional quantum Hall states, uh, they are all uh, non invertible. And also for Fosanica uh, uh, two dimensional topology order, the, the, the invertible one is the E8 quantum Hall states. Yeah, I, it's just a name, so I won't go into the detail here. And uh, so actually, the invertible topology order uh, have the classification. In two parts of dimension, we have a Z class, just a stacking of a Y, the quantum Hall state. For Fermanic one, 
is the p-plus happy super conductor stacking stacking with that give us a z class of fermionic topology order etc in three plus one dimension we believe there's no invert no there's no non uh, invertible topology order maybe no proof uh, the, but in four plus one dimension there's a z2 class and etc so we have this uh, uh we have this uh, uh story yes Consistent pentagon identity of F symbol does not see invertible topological phases. Uh no, the, the this uh, module transactory do not see invertible one at all. Invertible topology other have a uh, no onion. The the reason is falling. We have a we we have onions. Uh onion cannot hop between between layers. So if I have two layers of topology, each one have onion. Anyang as a topologic station, they cannot be destroyed by themselves. So Anyang cannot hop from one layer to another layer. And uh, so therefore, when you have a non-trivial Anyang, so stacking layers, you always get more Anyang. You never get the less Anyang. So that's why, uh, that's why uh, this, uh, the stacking operation is not group operation. It's about the monoline op operation. But however, if some topology have no Anyangs, then stacking them still have no onion, so they, they form a group. They, they have an inverse. Okay, so that is that's one thing. Another thing is that uh, why we have a fraction order in three dimension, not in two dimension, really because uh, in three dimension, the layer, two dimensional layer, can have non trivial, non invertible topology order. Stacking non invertible topology order gave us a layered structure which cannot be destroyed. You know, and so therefore this affiliation would persist. And uh, so that's a fraction order is intrinsically related to this non-invertible topology in two dimension. In in two dimensional space, we can stack one dimensional chain, but we don't have a non-trivial, non-invertible topology order as a one dimensional chain. Then then we, we don't have a fraction phase in two dimensional space. So existence of a non-invertible topology in two-dimensional space tell us we can have fraction phase in one higher dimension or two higher dimension because this is a stacking non-invertibility. Uh, yeah, when you're stacking more and more layers, it became more and more complicated. So this kind of UV structure cannot be renormalized away uh, no matter what you do. So, so there's a UVR mixing. Yeah, this is very much related to this fraction order, yes. Um, are there lattice realizations of the, well, I guess, I mean, the, the one plus one D one, the fermion, that actual circuit type chain, but. Oh, 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 all these have lattice realization. Right. Okay, even the E8 phase. E8 yeah. type, but it's not soluble. Okay. It's belong to that uh, non soluble. Phase. Okay, okay. And this one have a soluble, is that soluble model to realize on lattice? Yeah, there's a recent paper, you know. <laughs> Uh, a lattice realization, Hamiltonian lattice realization of this model. Is it just kind of accidental, or is there like a dimensional reason why, like in two plus one D, they're not? Yeah, yes, it is. Uh, okay, maybe <laughs> in two plus one D, if you go one, the Z class means we have a Panchakian class in one higher dimension. So Z class all relate to this uh, uh, gravitational transformation term. Okay. The Z plus Z in six plus one means that uh, in eight dimension. There's two different projection classes, P and the P2 and the P1 square, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And so I have two. And here, we have, it's just P1, we have one. And in other dimension, we don't have Z class because we don't have a projection class in one higher dimension. Okay. But uh, here, Z2, we have some uh, so called stiff winning class. All these uh, yeah, yeah. algebraic topology come in. So yeah. it's a uh, lot of fun, also very scary. <laughs> okay, so is it the, that's, that's, People with Nick class and one I already mentioned, that's realizable by a commuting projector. By community projector, yes. But the point triagging classes are not. Can, it cannot get okay, yeah. yeah, that's a that that's a, that's a that's a thing. But you can say P plus I P is a is a soluble, but a soluble in terms of, of a free fermion, not in terms of a commuting terms. So it's a less of a solubility, you know. Is it simply because the fermions don't commute? No, not because of the, or because of the definition of solubility, because of, uh, in the free fermion, it's a still algebraic complexity. And uh, we say that one is a soluble. 
We have a committing project, it's all the one complex thing. Okay. It's not, we don't even need to put the computer to analyze the algebraic large matrix. The many body is an exponentially complex state. We have diagonalized yeah. exponential large matrix to solve it. And in physics, we usually say this algebraic complexity means solving for, okay. for, for free fermion theory. Okay. okay. And uh, so, uh, so maybe let me, let me just try to finish it. And uh, uh, so there's uh, other things, but I don't want to uh, go through this. So, so and, and here I just want to say that uh, the, you know, so far we have module time set category theory described by N, F, and R, you know, this kind of data. You know, at the beginning, when we do this uh, uh, topology quantity analysis, we have ST matrix, representation of a modular group to describe topology order. So now we have a two set of, the two way of describe topology, one through puncture, another through ground states. And when we combine these two, two, uh, two description with, there's a lot of relations. Like this, uh, uh, this Valenda formula, this uh, S matrix and the fusion ring are related by this uh, amazing formula. <laughs> okay. And also this uh, topological spin and the T matrix are related by, by this formula, a very simple formula. So there's a lot of relation. Then because there's a lot of relation and also we have a lot of consistent condition for this uh, N and uh, R, F and R. There's a lot of condition and those conditions can be translated into condition on S matrix and the T matrix. So this way, using multi-tensor category theory, we obtain a lot of condition, additional condition we don't know before on the ST matrix. So this is, uh, you can see I'm too ambitious. <laughs> okay, so you can see for the ST matrix, uh, 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 we also have a condition that is, uh, uh, no, this, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I. Okay. Yeah. This is a. Uh, okay. Let me do this. Explain what I'm doing here. Okay. From here, we can express NIJK using S matrix. And then if you know the, uh, uh, if you know the NI, if you know S matrix, we know NIJK. If you know the NIJK and the spin, we know S matrix. So it's a, so the, in both direction. So, so therefore, uh, originally I'm thinking, yeah, we can, we should formulate a theory using ST matrix to, uh, uh, to, to, to write down a, a theory for topology order. But equally well, because these two, these two set data, can uh, uh, give right to each other as uh, one to one. So we can also equivalently using NIJK and the topology spin using this pair of data to describe uh, topology order. So, so I will formulate our condition on ST matrix, but not directly, but uh, on, 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 on NIJK and SI. And uh, so this is what I try to list here, you know, and uh, yeah, the NIJK with the self data this is sent uh, some condition here, and there's some other condition. And uh, then there's an amazing thing that uh, this, uh, this topology spin on NIJK also satisfy this condition where this uh, V is uh, this complete combination of NIJK. So there's a lot of study and uh, uh, we, we, have, we, we, we get a lot of a condition. And uh, so then, then, then we can use NIJK to construct ST matrix. And then ST matrix should form a SL2 representation, you know, and the central, you know, basically it's a, there's a lot of math. It's a very messy, but, uh, uh, but the computer don't mind the messy things as long as, long as deal with the numbers. Then you can put all this into the computer. Then finally you get this a table for, uh, a module tensor category. And, but this table, there's some, you have, there's some, it's not very rigorous in the sense that we only classify ST matrix. The ST matrix and the module tensor category is not one to one. There's a little bit of missing things. And, uh, but, uh, if you don't mind this missing thing, then we get some uh, table. And uh, so there's a, so like this, a Samyang theory are described as a Laughlin wave function. And, uh, uh, and, you know, there's a, so the, the one with the red, uh, uh, we know some kind of uh, wave function realization, you know. 
So, so from here, we, we get some kind of quantitative theory of a topology order. Yeah, I think I will take a break here or five minutes break here. I think we will meet 10, 20, five yeah. minutes break. Yeah. yeah, thank you. 11, 20. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, 11, 20. <laughs> Yeah. Hmm? Yes. Yeah, yeah. In the CFT, there is a fusion category, and uh, uh, but in a different way. Uh, a CFT have this uh, so-called topological uh, line. Yeah, the topological line actually uh, their fusion uh, uh, form of fusion kind of thing. and uh, so actually this is this is what I'm going to discuss uh, uh, maybe next. That is uh, the the yeah this uh, uh, this the topology line is a, is a symmetry, and uh, their fusion category became a symmetry, and all they are all connected. Yeah, so so actually this uh, this really is a uh, a uh, uh, Point of view that the fusion category or module tensor category, so CFT contain hidden module tensor category because this the top of the line actually gave rise to module tensor category. And then we hope maybe this hidden module tensor category in the CFT completely describe the CFT. So that's a way to to describe CFT from from this single point of view. What? Yeah, uh, maybe not. Yeah, because fusion category, we use fusion category to construct the string length model. Yeah. And uh, but that one is not ready to safety. But the the, the topological uh defect line is ready to safety. Yeah, Nico, so
Yeah, I think. I think I need some help. <laughs> No, no, yeah, that's totally right. Is there any known example where you can say that's why all that, but there is no. No, no I don't know. Yeah. No, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, that's a very good question. No, I don't know. Uh, right now, what's happening is that the, uh, yeah, we know there are insufficient data, there's degeneracy. Whether the kind of example where they set this condition, but then no, I should, let me ask us uh, my 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 collaborators. Uh, I think actually I don't know. Yeah, I I need to switch to another. I don't know. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, most of the module tensor categories theory are related to Kazumuni algebra and their coset construction. In this case, actually, we we know that we, we can use them this way to get, get the realization. If there are some module tensor categories not related to Kazumuni algebra, yeah. then there's, there's, there's a few cases we probably, that may be more difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, could you uh, switch? I need to switch for the other slides. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how to get. Oh, this. Uh, this yeah, our eyes only on the computer. It's a uh, no, no. Yeah, that's one. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay, maybe let's uh, uh, start. Uh, so after all this uh, uh, discussion about topology order or category, it's something more uh, fancy stuff. And uh, so let's go back to this uh, uh, physical question, uh, the phase diagram. You know, in the first lecture, we talked about uh, we are considering the one plus one dimensional uh, system with S3 symmetry. That seems a uh, uh, a uh, very simple uh, situation. We should know everything about it. Uh, why we talk about that? And we know that uh, we have a S3, have a four subgroup S3 and a Z1 and also Z2, Z3. And uh, in the symmetry breaking phase, there's a four symmetry breaking phase, which have unbroken symmetries given by S3, Z2, Z3, and Z1. So we use the unbroken symmetry to label those. Uh, 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 symmetry breaking phase. And uh, because they're discrete symmetry, uh, these are gapped states. And uh, so there's a wider question that uh, whether this, uh, uh, whether this, uh, do we have other uh, state? In addition to this uh, four symmetry breaking state, do we have other uh, gap phase, like SPD phase for S3 symmetry, et cetera? And uh, according to group cohomology theory, the answer is no, but whether, whether some other theory, you, you may go beyond the group cohomology, you get something, you know. So there's a similar question here. But the most interesting way is that uh, uh, for this uh, full symmetry, there's a five pair of, uh, uh, of group subgroup relation. So this, uh, those, are, those are five pairs of group subgroup. So, so we can't expect for every group subgroup relation, uh, maybe there's a, a a continuous phase transition. 
So maybe we, we expect to have a five continuous phase transition. So it is some numeric calculation. Indeed, we find that it's a five transition. Indeed, they all looks continuous. Uh, but, uh, but the one with the uh, connecting S3 to Z1 is, we are not so certain. It's, but it looks continuous, but we are not so not certain. Uh, other transition also looks continuous, but we are more certain. The reasons are because we can identify the CFT for the other four transition, but we, at the moment, we do not know how to identify the CFT for this transition. Yeah. So that is a, a wonderful a big question. Yeah. So this one, is, we don't know the CFT. So we are now building marks sometimes can be misleading, you know. Maybe it's very weak for software <laughs> and or maybe for some other reason. If you don't know CFT, we are not so certain. Numerical data quality, uh, in, yeah, this one is not as good also. Uh, so the, so for this uh, Z2 to Z1 transition, that's a signature, Z2 signature breaking. So that's the icing model, C to one half icing model. And uh, for S3 to Z3, it's uh, also we break Z2 symmetry. And uh, that's also a C to one half of CFT, but maybe with some different combination. There, there's something, there's slight difference. I try to say different. The reason I say different is falling. Uh, this uh, this uh, symmetry, uh, you can see the uh, at the critical point of this transition do not have S3 symmetry, but the critical point of this point, this transition have S3 symmetry. So from point of view of S3 quantum spin system, uh, these two critical points also looks both six to one half, I think, transition point, but uh, there's slight difference. Uh, this uh, I3 quantum number assignment is different. It's just, it's, and maybe just that. The I3 quantum number assignment can be different. And uh, then uh, then we have a similar story for Z3 to Z1 transition is a C to four over five CFT. It's less than one, so it's a minimum model. It's a six five minimum model. And uh, and this one is uh, is this one, and uh, we know this because uh, we basically can compute the central charge. This uh, this uh, this red line are the central charge, and uh, the uh, uh, then from central charge is a uh, we we get those values. So so and because because the minimum model we, we feel pretty certain and that's it. And there's certainly some many other uh, calculations for these two cases. It's well studied the post model, IC model is real real studied. Because those those uh, those four situations is so well studied, uh, I would say this one must be known. But unfortunately, I I I don't know. I, I tried looking for literature. If someone know your literature, I really uh, wish uh, to whether someone studied this S three to Z one transition, or whether there's uh, some uh, some result or some theory, some thought about that. However, there's even more because. Uh, we even have multi critical points. So we can have, have multi critical points here and here. And then when you turn the parameter, then we may have a four phase meet at one point. Again, this part uh, is not totally certain because uh, there's maybe a small segment of a penny transition. Maybe it's a single multi critical point. It's a, yeah. But I think probably this one is indeed a, a, a multi critical point uh, connecting four phase. And those are multi critical points connecting three phase. So then we have a rich issue of the, what is a, uh, what is a, uh, what is the CFT of those multi critical point? Yeah, there, there's a, uh, so those, those are questions, uh, we want to address. So, so therefore, uh, what I'm going to do in, in, in this lecture and in the lecture next Monday is, uh, we try to use categorical same approach to obtain or constrain those critical points. And, uh, uh, we hope we can determine them completely, but if not, at least we constrain them largely. There are only a few selections. And this is uh, normal because uh, we have symmetry can constrain the dynamics. And so therefore, if you know the symmetry, then you can constrain the, the CFT. Uh, however, the categorical symmetry is a, it's a like symmetry, but more than Euro symmetry, so it's a it's a kind of extended version of symmetry. So actually, the categorical symmetry would uh, 
would consume more. Uh, we get more information. Basically, that is uh, uh, the message I try to uh, bring here. So, uh, so, so one thing is that, uh, remember I said, it's S3 to the translation, we don't know. But at the moment, I think you can say that, uh, you know, maybe one of the following three cases may be true. One of them must, must be true. Either this uh, S3 to Z translation is described by the same CFT as S3 to Z2 translation, which is this uh, uh, path model CFT, uh, this one. A little bit strange because symmetry breaking pattern are different, but uh, the CFT is entirely the same. I mean, it's completely the same. Even the assignment of a quantum number is the same. So, yeah, I don't know whether people can rule out this, uh, you know, uh, uh, at most, I, can, I feel this may be unlikely, but uh, yeah, very strange result. Or it's described by a CFT with certain charge more than one. This is also surprising because we know there's a unstable, okay, this CFT is a, with a, Large center chart only, but only one relevant operator. We already know a CFT with a two relevant operator with a uh of the same or symmetry. The center charge is only uh as a a, a a five over six. So there's already a CFT with center charge five over six, with already with two relevant operator. But however, to describe this transition, that CFT don't work because that's a two relevant operator. Uh, to have a stable condition transition, we have to have one round. Then we, we require there's a CFP with only one round operator, but with a large central charge. And I think that this one's possible. Yeah. But uh, kind of strange. Or maybe this continuous transition just do not exist. It's just like uh, the continuous transition between Z3 and Z2 do not exist. You know, this is the lambda forbidden. The Z2 and Z3 is not group stopping correlation. There's no continuous phase transition. So maybe we have same thing, the S3 to Z1, no continuous phase transition uh, for some reason. Yeah. So when you consider categorical symmetry for the theory where they already have a, a symmetry. Yeah. So what is the real, I mean, the uh, difference? Yeah, I will explain categorical symmetry in a moment. So right now I just, uh, I, re I just use a word I have not explained what is the categorical symmetry. Yeah, I, I, I will do that. That's, that's, that's the main, main topic of this, uh, of the remaining lecture. Yeah. Okay. So that is a, that is a, uh, that's a one thing. Another thing we want to obtain is that using categorical symmetry is that uh, the transition from S3 to Z1 and transition from Z3 to Z2 are equivalent transitions. There's a duality mapping, map one to another. Yeah, and this one is, uh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's some kind of not definite results. That is, uh, so if S3 to Z1, uh, have a continuous transition, then it must, the Z3 to Z2 must have continuous transition. If you think Z2, Z3 cannot have continuous transition, with a uh, with a one relevant operator, then S3 to Z1 cannot have a continuous transition with a one relevant operator. So really completed duality mapping between two. And this can be seen from this categorical symmetry. And also the CFT describing the two transition, if it are continuous, the CFT describing two transition uh, have same, the same CFT. Maybe the operator, maybe the naming operator can switch but the scaling dimension, the spectrum scaling dimension, are all the same. Central charge is the same. So, yeah. In, I, if I remember correctly, you said previously that for these possible phase transitions, it looked like the central charge was 1.3. Yes. So, so is it, can, can you, can you show that it can't just be a direct product of these two minimal models? Yes. Is that it, maybe, maybe, yes. Yeah, that, 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 that we haven't tried to say that. The concern is that, uh, uh, whether there's a, a more than one relevant operator or not. Yeah, the, because this is stable transition. So it must be CFT with only one S3 symmetric relevant operator. When you do this direct product, maybe there's more than one relevant, but there's a concern. Both, both of these are, both are stable? What? what? Because there's a line, you can see there's a, this, this, this transition is a whole line is continuous. 
So maybe the single CFT describing this whole line for continuous translation. Just like here, this is icing model describing whole line for continuous translation. Yeah. That's a, so that means uh, there's only one relevant direction here, only one relevant direction. Yeah, yeah so this is a, uh, yeah, I wish, uh, uh, you know, some people that explain this, uh, they kind of gave some stuff. You know, I'm very surprised that uh, even for this very simple thing in one dimension, we still have open question. We should know everything here. But uh, but this only the first the simplest non-building group. I can imagine I pick any non-building group and uh, and I try to construct that global phase diagram. We may see a lot of phase and see a lot of critical line, and we and we don't know their CFT. So actually, even in this one D system with discrete symmetry, maybe there's still a lot of unknown, and we need a, some machinery, a systematic machinery, to really uh, you know get those information. Now we should know everything, you know, for one D. But certainly that's a this a. Maybe we need new machinery. That's what I'm hoping. Then this this new machinery maybe uh may 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 apply to higher dimensions. So maybe get a more a more systematic understanding of a CFT. So actually, that's the main motivation for those uh, study. Yeah. Very nice uh, physical question. So when you have this uh, phase transition, yes. When you approach this this boundary of phase transition, in traditional sense, do you, do you, the system develop some long range correlation yes, even in this yes, case? Yeah, indeed. There's other parameter. All those translations, the oh, so you, you, translation, you, you, you there's define... a local other parameter. The Kinson law theory works, yes. uh -huh. but also do not work because Kinson law theory at the midfield level predict that uh, this transition, okay. Uh, Predict this transition like these three to Z one is the first order because you have you uh -huh. have cubic term. Kinson law theory have a, must can have first order transition, but uh, in reality, quantum theory, theory this transition is the second order. It's continuous, but but, but the transition is really described by other parameter. Yeah, but this is just one dimensional system. Yes, then just by looking at the divergent. Divergence of correlation length. Yes. Can you can you uh, discriminate uh, different phase transition? Yeah, you can. Yeah. Oh. So uh, how, how? What's the character? Oh, that's a scaling dimension. You know, when when have operator uh, near pretty point, they have algebraic correlation, uh -huh. and there's scaling dimension. I see. And uh, so this uh, this exponent. Uh, uh -huh. actually, I didn't show the data. You know, in this tandem net network computation. Mm -hmm. Uh, the the exponent can be computed. I see. And uh, but not for which operator we can compute the spectrum of a allowed exponent. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh uh so 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 there's a one half or maybe the one sixteenth. You know, those exponents there. I see. And then when you, then when you actually measure this uh spin spin correlation function mm -hmm. at a critical point, you will see this uh algebraic decay with that right. exponent. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Okay. So, so this, uh, uh, so when I say CFT, I really mean this collection of those exponents, you know, it's a, uh, or no. But we wish we know that for, for this transition. <laughs> uh, for this transition, we don't know. Numerically, they can compute that, but theoretically, we don't have a theory to, to, to predict what kind of exponent you expect to see. For other full transition, uh, we know, we, we know there's CFT. Knowing CFT means, uh, we know all the exponents, actually. Okay. So, so now, what is categorical symmetry? But well, let me see why we have a categorical. Why, why we why we do this? Because uh, we know that symmetry can constrain the dynamics. Different symmetry give you different constraints of dynamics. Similarly, this anomaly symmetry can constrain dynamics. Higher symmetry, anomaly higher symmetry, algebra higher symmetry, anomaly they all constrain dynamics. So therefore, from this sense, all those symmetries are similar. They just uh, constrain the low the dynamics. Then the categorical symmetry is just a, a unified way to decide all this in the one same in the same formalism. So all those uh, constraining dynamics can be viewed uh, from this point of view. Okay, it's just unified unifying all those symmetries in the one framework, in a single framework. Then what is the categorical symmetry? You know. 
I already mentioned a little bit, the symmetry and the anomaly are related. So actually, categorical symmetry is a, a gravitational anomaly, but actually it should be mostly it's a non-invertible gravitational anomaly. And uh, uh, it's a symmetry plus a dual symmetry. You know, basically, you know, when we have a critical theory, we know there's other operator, disorder operator. If you order a disorder operator together at the same footing, then that's some flare of a categorical symmetry. Viewing these two together at the same footing, that's a, a, another point of view of a categorical symmetry. Um, because gravitational anomaly is a correspondent topology in higher, one higher dimension, so categorical symmetry actually is a topology in one higher dimension. And, uh, so I, actually, I'm going uh, going to use this mostly. And the topology of higher dimension actually is a is a, a very diffusion non-degenerate very diffusion category or MPC. So this also the same thing. And uh, it's also a a, a a a equivalent class of algebra of a local symmetric operator. So so I mainly I will mostly presenting uh, uh presenting uh, this point of view and this point of view and also this uh. Uh, this topology in higher dimension, this this point of view. So this is uh, this many different way to to look at the uh, categorical symmetry. Uh, but however, uh, I just want to want to say that uh, uh, many people, maybe most people, use categorical symmetry to mean uh, uh, to mean uh, to mean this algebraic higher symmetry or non-invertible symmetry, and. Uh, so uh, uh, we, uh, in, in this lecture, we don't use that meaning, you know. Uh, Non-invertible symmetry is non-invertible symmetry. Categorical symmetry is something different. It's in, in one higher dimension. It, even dimension is different. So so let's present the point of view. The categorical symmetry is a symmetry plus a dual symmetry, or the order parameter plus disorder operator. You know, so it's that point of view. So that's fine, it's the easiest actually. And uh, so let's again consider example like the one plus one dimensional uh, transverse field icing model. That's a Z coupling and the X coupling. Okay. The Z2 symmetry is just a spin flip, the spin up, spin down flip. That's the Z2 symmetry. Okay. So, so what is a, uh, what is a symmetry? Oh, you say, oh, it's this. But here I want to say that. Uh, uh, let's not look at symmetry from a transformation point of view. Okay. Let's look at the symmetry from excitation point of view. Uh, the reason is following. When you're looking at uh, symmetry from a transformation point of view, you actually break the symmetry. It means uh, you have an instrument whose interaction with your system breaks the symmetry. Then you examine the transformation property of the symmetry. But however, if you have a symmetry, if, however, if your instrument and their interaction with your system do not break symmetry, there's an issue. How do you measure symmetry? If you do not break symmetry at all, then you cannot perform a transformation. So that point of view is related to this. Now we're using excitation. So suppose let's assume we have a, we think that it's a, consider this a left or right basis. Okay. Then the the our vacuum. Let's assume vacuum is all the spin point to the right. Then the then the spin point to the yeah this is right. The spin point to the left, this red one, we call some charge. Then then because this uh uh this uh this z term, uh the z term flip this uh, left or right. So this two z term. So that means that this two because we don't have this two z term. So that means that. Uh, we only annihilate a pair of left spin, not a single one. And so therefore, we have mode two conservation. Only a pair of spin can annihilate to, uh, a pair of charge can annihilate, a single charge cannot annihilate. So that's a, this a, using fusion rule to describe zero symmetry. And just conservation law. Conservation law gave us zero symmetry. Then we can also choose in the up and down basis, like this up and down basis. Then in up-down basis, we have domain walls. Then we view domain wall as something. Then we suddenly realize that domain wall also have a Z2, mode two conservation. The single domain wall cannot disappear by itself. The two domain wall can disappear. So it's very similar to 
sorry, it's a, it's very similar to this left spin. There's a Z2 conservation for left spin, and there's a Z2 conservation of a domain wall, up down domain wall. And that's it. So this is Z2 motor conservation is a Z2 symmetry, that's the ordinary one. And for domain wall Z2, more Z2 conservation is a Z2 dual symmetry. We call that dual symmetry. And uh, then for people who are familiar with all the disorder approaches, this domain wall is like a disorder approach, something, something along that direction. So that's what I say. So you can see that so this, uh, uh, this simple IC model have a hidden symmetry, have a Z2 symmetry and a Z2 dual symmetry, have both actually. Uh, actually, one imply another. If you break one, you also break the other. But if one appear, another also appear. But at least formally, we can have this. Then, then we, so therefore the, uh, the combination of these two symmetries, Z2 and Z2 dual, is the categorical symmetry. So that's, that, that's what we mean by categorical symmetry. And we use this very simple, this, uh, string symbol V, not the times. You know, we have combined two symmetry, it's just a Z2 times Z2. Well, what, why we do with V, not times. And uh, so let's consider, to understand that, let's consider this symmetry more carefully. When you have a symmetry, we should have a charge operator. You know, the operator create a charge. But here we want to consider the operator to create a pair of charge. Because the operator creating a pair of charge representing the little more two conservation. I mean, two charge can annihilate. So therefore we have the operator creating a pair of charge is a allowed operator. Okay, so to create a pair of a Z2 charge, we just have a Z, I, Z, J. So this operator creates a pair of a Z2 charge. Then the pair, the operator which create a pair of a, a, a dual symmetry charge is actually a string operator. So it's a multiplication of X, uh, a Z, X, uh, so the sigma X of between I and the J. It's a, it's a segment, it's a string operator. And that's, that's a flip a spin in, in, in a region. And uh, then that's a, that's a, that's a domain wall. Uh, you know, that, that's give a, create a two domain wall. So this term of the early, early create a two domain wall. Okay. And, uh, so this, uh, seems, uh, this kind of strange because, uh, to create two chart, you should have a two local operator. But uh, for the dual spin, it's a uh, not two local operator, just a, a, it's a string operator. But here, let's, uh, let's say, maybe this is a generic case. In general, we need a string operator to create a two charge. Then we also view this is string operator. It's just, this is just a string operator with empty bulk. <laughs> the bulk is identity. So it's also, so, so actually that's a terminology we actually use. We view both as a string operator. And, uh, so this a pair of charge are created by a string operator. And uh, the charge are located as a boundary of a string operator. Some kind of strange way to think of this. But anyway, so, uh, but when you have this charge pair operator, then something interesting happened. We can study more. We find this, uh, these two different charge pair equation operator have non-trivial commutation relation. If they, if they, if the boundary kind of straddled in a non-trivial way, <laughs> you know, if, if the boundary is not, not, I don't know, if, if the boundary link that is non-trivial, if the boundary is not linked, like, like this way, then they commute. And, uh, but however, we can, we can view the different order of applying operator as a time direction. So like, a, so like a, this two different order doing multiplication, like a, this vertical is time direction. Then these two pictures, the comparison of these two pictures is almost like this, because uh, uh, this end can, can annihilate us, then we get a loop going around the charge. That's like a braiding. <laughs> yeah. So indeed, even though you want the measure system, but the operator algebra of this string operator contain braiding. And uh, so at, at that point, that's we, we view the string operator, the boundary as a, our particles, and, but from the string operator, somehow we can decide the braiding statistics of a, this particle, even though this one is a one dimensional. So somehow the different order of a applying operator 
gave rise to another you mentioned, and uh, we suddenly get a braided fusion category, even for this one dimensional thing. Yeah. And, and this is all exactly what you want, yes. So, so can we consider this uh, string as a topological object in space time? Yes. So, uh, the, I think, uh, 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 yes. Uh, because this operator, this string operator, we will apply that in the in time slice. Yeah. Yeah. We do Hamiltonian, but you you can yeah you can you can rotate the two direction where say mm -hmm. you, it's really big camera. I see. Yeah. So so that is the part of the categorical symmetry. Yeah. Exactly. Function. Yeah. So indeed, uh, this uh, this closely related to this uh 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 top, top, what's your topological line defect of of the main topological boundary the topological domain wall or something. I don't know. I don't know what's what's, what's the official name. Uh, but line defined only one dimension. Uh, in any dimension, what do you call that? Topological membrane, topological brain. Yeah, maybe topological brain probably is a favorite name. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, uh, so because of this uh, this non non trivial commutation relation for the charge pair operator, so we say that the v that's what this v means. They are not independent. Usually, we have z two cross z two. The charge creation, charge pair equation operator do not have this non-trivial braiding. <laughs> and let's call this a braiding. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, that, that is the key. Now, now, now I can see that this, uh, this, uh, this way of looking at the symmetry, we not only have symmetry, have a charge, but also somehow there's a braiding. And, uh, uh, so this kind of structure starts to appear. And, and this play will play a key role. Okay. Uh, so, so let's look at this uh, operator more carefully. Actually, it's already, uh, clear that, uh, so this, uh, this, uh, dual Z2 charge operator, this, this, this operator created a dual Z2 charge. If you look at it, it's actually a symmetry transformation operator, but only on the patch, on the segment, not everywhere. And this is important because, uh, Usually when you do symmetry transformation, we do global transformation, we do symmetry transformation everywhere. But we don't need to. We just say we only need to define our symmetry, trans symmetry transformation on the patch. That's enough because our Hamiltonian is a sum of local operator. Then this patch operator, patch symmetry transformation is enough uh, to determine which local operator is allowed or not allowed. We just commute this, uh, this, uh, patch symmetry operator with the uh, other local operator. If they commute, then we say this out allowed. As long as this local operator is not close to the boundary, we have this condition that uh, is far away from boundary. So therefore, this uh, patch symmetry operator is enough to determine the symmetric uh, local operator and determine symmetric Hamiltonian. And maybe this is useful because, uh, to define our operator act on infinity system is uh, sometimes troublesome. And uh, but now we say that even, even when your system is infinity, you can define your symmetry transformation in a finite subsystem. And that's enough to, to build everything. So uh, this kind of thinking is uh, very helpful actually. So it's really, uh, it's really a symmetry, little symmetry transformation. And, uh, so then from the similarity, we will say, well, maybe this Z2 charge pair operator, ZIZJ, should generate a Z2 tilde transformation, dual symmetry transformation on the, on the, on the middle, on the patch. But here you don't, the, the box is empty, they don't do anything. Okay. Then actually, uh, it, 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 we can make them to do something by doing this, uh, 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 uh Kramer's one uh, duality transformation. We we'll do this transformation. That is a, we have another model. The spin now live on the link, not on the site. And then we have this mapping. The x go to this, uh, z, this, this dual spin, uh, has a mapping like that. Then when you do the mapping, you'll find this, uh, the z2 charge pair operator became, a, uh, uh, yeah, be, yeah, actually, this is, this should, this should be dual spin, actually a tilt here. Yeah, this is dual spin. It became, became the one with non-empty bulk. 
And so this one indeed is a is a is a Z2 dual symmetry in the dual model. Yeah. So indeed we have this uh, uh, really uh, very uh, uh, equal footing symmetry. Yeah. And also the original this uh, string operator which is doing Z2 symmetry transformation became a pair of uh, empty bulk operator in the dual model, which only created two Z2 charge. Z2 dual Z2 charge. So this uh, uh so from here you can see that uh, this uh, putting two things together is kind of more symmetric way uh, to look at this uh, this uh, my I think model. And uh, so so this is kind of from ad operator algebra point of view to look at uh, those uh, uh, those uh, categorical symmetry. And actually this uh, operator algebra point of view uh, have uh, this uh, uh, have uh, this uh, uh, have a holographic picture. This uh, this two Z two symmetry become explicit and obvious when you have a, doing this holographic picture. It's very similar to the to ADF CFT picture where global symmetry in the boundary become gate zero in the box. Here is the same thing. We have, if you have Z two symmetry on the boundary, we have Z two gate zero in the box, and it works. Okay. Uh, when you have Z two gate zero in the box, which is two dimension two plus one dimensional box. And uh, we have a trivial extension that's nothing. And we have a little chart we call the E. And we have little flux we call the M. The both are both are. And we also have a little charge flux bound states, which is fermion. Okay. It turns out that uh, this, uh, the Z2, Z2 chart can be viewed as a dual Z2 flux. And Z2 flux can be viewed as a dual Z2 charge. Because the domain wall in the Z2 is like a, is is a flux of Z2, but the domain wall is a dual Z2 charge. Yeah. So so that's how we have the we have this uh, uh relation. Okay. And uh, so so therefore you can see uh in in one higher dimension theory, uh both the E and M have a Z2 fusion. They have a model two conservation. So we immediately have this uh. Uh, uh, Z2, uh, we have both, we have two symmetry immediately and explicitly we have two symmetry. And also, this E and M, although they are both boson, they indeed have non trivial mutual statistics. So that's also in line with from our operator point of view. Yeah, it's uh, they all, all fit. Yeah. So, 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 so therefore, it's a, uh, so therefore, this, this, this Z2 gate theory in one higher dimension is also, we can also call that a categorical symmetry. It's a, it's a, it's a same, gave rise to the same picture of this uh, string operator picture. Okay, so now let's, uh, so this, uh, so the basic, this, uh, the conclusion is that this uh, categorical symmetry can also be viewed as a topology order in one higher dimension. Yeah. So now let's consider a situation where this uh, E particle conducts. Okay. So E particle can conduct in the Z2 gauge theory. And that's what, what is that? That's Higgs mechanism. You know, E part is like a charged field, bosonic charged field. They condense your, 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 your Higgs. That's a Higgs. You get a Higgs phase. Okay. And in the Higgs phase, uh, this, uh, this uh, bosonic field have non trivial, non zero expression value. In this case, uh, the M and F were confined because uh, E and MF have non trivial mutual statistics. So therefore, when you have M and F, the MF will create a branch cut in this uh, kind of say other parameter field. And this branch cut is long, so you have this, uh, have energy along the branch cut. So you have a, uh, so energy diverge, uh, linearly diverge. And, uh, so therefore this, uh, uh, this MF have a linear confinement, uh, in this uh, condensed space. And also the E condensed space, the, uh, the, the E particle is trivial because uh, it can be absorbed by the condensation. So therefore, in the E condensed phase, there's no excitation. So therefore, this uh, is uh, expected this trivial topology order. It's a product state. Okay, it's really product state. And if you consider the main wall between the Z gauge theory and this E condensed state, the E condensed state is a product state. It's trivial. It's a vacuum. We can remove it. So this domain wall can also be viewed as a boundary of a Z2 gauge theory. Yeah. And this part is standard, but uh, that's the main point. There's a, the boundary of Z2 gauge theory can be viewed from condensation point of view. 
because the condensation give you a, a trivial phase in another half. Remove trivial phase, then you say bind the condensation can induce a boundary. So that's really the, the picture here. So therefore, you can see that the M can condense. If M condense, one always condense, you know, one is nothing, so one always condense. So that if we can have a boundary where the M, one condense, M condense, M condense also gives rise to the trivial phase. And so therefore, so there's a one boundary is M condense. It's a gap boundary given by the M condense. Okay. And in this phase, uh, M condensed. So therefore, the Z2, D2 symmetry is spontaneously broken. But the Z2 symmetry is not broken, but E do not condense. So therefore, uh, this pattern for condensation gave rise to the Z2 symmetric phase, but the D2 Z2 spontaneously broken. That's one of the gap the boundary. And, uh, and this correspond the gap the phase in the icing model, uh, uh, Z2 symmetry not broken is a normal state, not symmetry breaking state. Then if you E, there's another boundary induced by the E condensation and the one condensation. And then in this case, the Z2 symmetry is sometimes broken, but Z2 2 is not broken. So it's really this picture. Now usually we consider Z2 symmetry. There are two phase of icing model. One is Z2 symmetric, another Z2 symmetry breaking. But we can also include dual symmetry. This is Z2 symmetric phase correspond to Z2 dual spontaneous breaking. Z2 spontaneous breaking phase correspond to Z2 dual symmetric phase. So it's really in line with this picture. So this is a kind of a strange way to understand the symmetry breaking and the, and the symmetric phase, but using categorical symmetry point of view from that point of view or from bulk point of view. And the message is that the, the boundary is given by the condensation. So different pattern of condensation gives rise to different boundary. And so, and this suddenly became very, very important. You know, categorical symmetry is a bulk topology order. It's a symmetry. And this symmetry determines what kind of condensation is possible. And determine what kind of a phase is possible controlled by this symmetry. Yeah, and this is the main message, yeah. Um, so at the critical point, the, the Ising CFT, I think usually people say it's, well, it's topological defect lines. It's, again, it's an Ising MTC category, right? Where like the Kramers veneer yeah. duality yeah. is included as some kind of, you know, categorical symmetry. Yes, yes. Is, but, no, but that's that, different from just a moment. Yeah. Let me come on that uh, okay. just in a moment. Okay. Yeah. So now you can see now say what happened at the critical point. You know, critical point touch this uh, Z2 symmetric phase. So the critical point should have Z2 symmetry. Because it's a it's a limit of Z2 symmetric phase, it should have a Z2 symmetry. This critical point also touch the Z2 dual symmetric phase, dual Z2 symmetric phase. So we all think, yeah, this can also have this symmetry. So critical point have a both. Actually, that's another way to say that uh, in the critical point, M and E do not condense. So only one condense. So that is uh, another condensation pattern. Nothing condense is uh, one possible condensation, yeah. And they have full uh, categorical symmetry. And this is a full category of symmetry, actually, is a gapless. It's the one with the full category is gapless. It's a representing the critical point. Yeah. So that is the picture. However, there's a one thing, as you mentioned, you know, maybe the critical point here we claim that this critical point have this kind of category of symmetry described by the Z2 gate theory. And this category symmetry include this Z2 symmetry, Z2 system, Z2 dual symmetry, but obviously they did not include the EM exchange symmetry. This Z2 gauge theory have an automorphism. When you exchange Z and M, everything is the same. And then you can, you can even say, let's, so, so actually there is no EM exchange symmetry in here and here, but at a critical point, 
there is an emergent ZMA chain symmetry. And which this emergent symmetry is not included here. So it's against the philosophy, you know, I, I mentioned uh, uh, maybe a few days ago. We want to include all the emergent symmetry. Maybe that is uh, give us a full information of a, of a critical point. And here we have an example which we, we, we did not include in any chain. But this simple, this example is very simple. We should do that and we do that. If you do that, then the symmetry is enlarged. The topology order in the box also enlarged, getting another topology order describing, including the EM exchange symmetry. And that topology order is a is double icing topology order. So therefore, the so therefore, if you include the EM exchange symmetry, the icing model critic point is a, have a is a full of we call the maximum categorical symmetry is a double icing topology order. And that probably is a is a better description. And but however, without using full category symmetry, this Z2 gig series already gave us a lot of information. Yeah, but you, you can you can see all these uh, features. Uh, I think I would uh, uh, stop here, and uh, so uh, so we can uh, yeah we'll continue continue next week next Monday. Yeah. Thank you very much. So now the talk is open for questions. Please ask anything. So is there any possibility that the critical point, uh, uh, just uh, uh, I mean the both uh, condensing? Wow. Oh yeah, that's a uh, that's the thing. Uh, uh, so, you see, so I can continue. <laughs> so the symmetry and uh, it's kind of strange. Is that a uh, uh, we, this is symmetry, dual symmetry, because they have non-trivial mutual statistics. We cannot break them together. It's impossible to break them together. But we can break one of them. Like uh, if you break, so to break them together is impossible. If you break one of them, then we can we can get gap face. If we do not break any of them, then this phase must be gapless. It's again associated with a non-trivial mutual statistics. These non-trivial mutual statistics actually have some connection, a flavor of anomalies. So, so you're having this categorical symmetry enforcing gaplessness condition. It's almost like anomalous symmetry enforcing gapless condition. It's the same flavor. Yeah. But this one is a more, uh, more systematic. And uh, actually, we, uh, later we'll 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 show indeed uh, this uh, uh, if a categorical solution is not broken, uh, the the boundary must be gapless. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So in <clears throat> you know when we think of when people talk about topological defect lines and one plus one d CFTs, yeah, uh, they say it's uh, as far as I know that. That they only form a fusion category, yeah, because they don't have braiding and yeah, more. So in some sense, it's like less structured. But then again, it, it's also like kind of less restrictive because you can also have non-commutative fusion rules. And uh, in some cases, apparently. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, non-commutative fusion rule. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so since you, you, you mentioned this, uh, yeah. so let me put this way. Uh, so the correct correspondence is the following. You can see here we have a two set operator. This is a, a W and W tilt. So we consider the algebra for both W and W tilt. If you only consider an algebra for one, or say only W, then you get an algebra for, for Z2 symmetry. And uh, then this, uh, this, that's a fusion category, right? And, uh, so, uh, the, in this sense, the fusion category have this, uh, you can define braiding. They, 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 they always trade your braiding. So we, we probably don't mention that. Yeah. And, uh, but however, when you consider both, both of this, then there's a non-trivial braiding. You know, what I try to say is that, uh, uh, in a non-invertible symmetry, uh, 
especially when you consider so-called anomaly free non invertible symmetry. Uh, you really consider this topology defect line and their fusion. But anomaly free means that uh, we kind of assume their boundary always have a, always both and always a trivial mutual, trivial mutual statistics. Okay. So a set of a uh, charge operator, which are uh, boundaries both on with a trivial mutual statistics, trivial mutual statistics, this set of charge operator would uh, generate some kind of uh, anomaly free symmetry. And this kind of charge operator can have the, the fusion can be complicated, uh, can be non invertible and et cetera. Yeah. But uh, what you said is uh, something I don't know. That is, uh, you know, in one dimension, the fusion can be uh, non commutative. <laughs> and uh, then this non commutative fusion do not have a two dimensional analog because Brady fusion category require commutative mm -hmm. fusion. Then in that case, I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I need yeah, to, actually, I need, I'm I need, not sure I, if there are actually like realizations of those. Yeah, but, uh, but, but that's uh, yeah. you stop. Yeah. You know, in the fusion category, we do allow this NIJK where IJ, you know, is the NIJK, IJ cannot switch, it's not symmetric. Mm. And that one don't have a bridge fusion category analog. Right. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't okay. know the answer. So whether <laughs> whether that is yeah. possible or uh or, or something. Yeah. But for like say like the Ising DFT with with like yeah, the Ising category as its uh fusion category symmetry, then like this version is saying basically you, you take the double version and that's the uh um yeah, I don't, I don't know. What, what I try to say that, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. What I try to say is, I think critical point have a lot of topological defect line. Right. If you include all of them, you get double icing. Yeah. Model. Okay. Yeah. You, you, you get double icing uh, topological order. Yeah. And uh, and uh, here when you do this uh, Z two top gauge theory, we do not include uh, this uh, EM exchange topological defect line. And uh, but we consider other oh, yeah, symmetry yeah. twisting topological defect line. Then, 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 then we get this picture, the small standard picture. But uh, the point of, uh, is that uh, for every conformal field theory, we should include all the topological defect line, and that gives you maximal categorical symmetry. Yeah. And uh, the question is that uh, whether that can be uh, used to fully characterize the CFT. And so, actually, I think there is a program to say the CFT is a, is characterized a classified module tensor category. So. Yeah. What I'm describing is along that line. That is a, the full tabular defect line is a module tensor category. Hopefully that can fully characterize the CFT. Yeah. Okay, thanks. More question? I, I have a, a very naive question. So to my understanding, uh, starting with your, some Hamiltonian, yeah. You define the topological object, yes. then you find uh, some symmetry obeyed by this topological object. Then uh, you classify this symmetry breaking. Yes. So my question is, can you capture uh, the final this physics starting with just uh, original Hamiltonian applying standard Ginsburg Landau symmetry breaking? Yeah, yeah. So it's, think, it's possible. Uh, yeah, it's possible. Let me then see. why do you need it, all this complicated? Yeah, that, that's a, I have a something. slide for this. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, it's a. Uh, it's here. Yeah. So uh, so let's try to label gap and gapless states. And uh, so we know that for the icing model, we have a kind of Z2 symmetry. There's a Z2 symmetric state, which is a gap. That's ordinary uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, paramagnetic state. Right. And uh, there are also a Z2 symmetric state, which is the gapless at a critical point. That's also Z2 symmetric. Yeah. And we have Z2 symmetry breaking state, which is a gap. Mm -hmm. So you can see in this way, we label things. The both uh, gap the state and the critical state have a Z2 symmetric. Mm -hmm. So there's a label of degenerate. Mm -hmm. Okay. But however, if you're using categorical symmetry, right. then we have a 
this uh, gap is a little symmetric, little to the breaking, mm -hmm. but the uh, but the uh, but the critical state actually is a uh, both symmetric, right? And that one is a uh, little breaking, a little to tilt for symmetric, right? So basically, so in this one, one correspondence, yeah, this one. But however, in the new label, mm -hmm. we break the general thing. So these two states are different. So this really means that uh, we view, we even view the gapless states and gap state at equal footing via condensation. And uh, so they all just different pattern condensation, which led to different symmetry breaking pattern. Uh, but so this kind of uh, symmetry breaking pattern and condensation, including gapless states now. If you only do this, if you ignore the gap states, these two symmetry breaking and breaking as good, they, they label two states. We include the gapless states, they're degenerate states. So that means that using the two symmetry picture, we cannot distinguish two different situations. And uh, then we, we the categorical symmetry give you more detailed information, you can distinguish that. But once you can distinguish that, it's a meaning because uh, you can compute the physical property from your label. Mm -hmm. Now you can see that these three phases have different label, and from this label we can compute their right, physical right. property. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, yeah. So there is some analogy uh, to to two-dimensional costalis Saulus uh, uh, phase transition. This is ordinary spin system. Yeah. But they introduce vortex, anti-vortex, and they they yeah oh describe yeah yeah the critical phenomena of this topological uh, object, exactly, but, exactly. Uh, but you can still understand from ordinary uh, spin degree of freedom yes yeah? the, the philosophy is uh, similar that is uh, you can see we can understand that this uh, we, if you're approaching critical point from the symmetric side mm -hmm. this critical point is obtained by the condensation or profilation of this z2 charge right if you're approaching critical point from central breaking side Mm -hmm. Is a profilation of a domain wall. That's the top of the defect, right. which is drive the transition. Yeah. So the, in that sphere, it's similar. I see. Okay. But however, the point of view is that uh, because critical point have this two point of view, mm -hmm. let's uh, bring these two point of view together. Mm -hmm. Then consider everything via condensation. And uh, because in this, you know, you are totally right. In this, like a some kind of fancy formalism, you know, what's the use of it? Mm -hmm. Because in this in this formalism, both gap and gapless states can be viewed as a condensation of some pattern. Mm -hmm. So pattern of condensation determine both gap and gapless states. Mm -hmm. Then by study pattern of condensation, we can derive their property. We can obtain their property. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a, a so that's the usefulness of this. So why we go to one higher dimension gets so fancy, but uh, mm -hmm. but then we'll. The, uh, behind uh, after that, there's a there's a, a unified uh, formalism mm -hmm. to to describing all these uh, gap and gapless phase at equal footing. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Please. So I think you explained the duality or bulk two plus one dimensional Z two gauge theory, and if the bulk theory is three plus one dimensional. Yeah. Z2 gauge theory. So what is the category uh, symmetry in the boundary? Uh, let's see, where is it? Yeah. So this is a, a picture for two plus one dimensional boundary and a three plus one dimensional oh. bulk. So we can have a Z2 symmetry in two plus one dimension. Then the bulk will be Z2 gig theory. The charge is still particle, but uh, the flux became a root strings. Mm -hmm. And then the then is the interesting. The, then the symmetry is still little symmetry is a charge, mm -hmm. but dual symmetry is a one symmetry. It's mm -hmm. higher symmetry mm -hmm. because of the charge became loose. And uh, so, uh, so therefore, if a if a string condense, you give a boundary which are just ordinary uh, little symmetric phase. However, if a charge condense give you another boundary, this boundary have a, this uh, uh, is a symmetric phase for the higher symmetry. And can you generate this duality to any higher dimension? Yeah. Uh -oh. So this is a this picture. You know, just just a 
just higher symmetry becomes that's really the, this uh, hard n dimensional space. So the Zn symmetry is due to the uh, Zn minus one symmetry. This is, this is kind of higher symmetry. And uh, actually, this picture even works for the non abelian group. For abelian group, this is Zn one dimensional higher symmetry. It's still a uh, higher symmetry. Mm -hmm. For non abelian group, uh, this symmetry is not is not higher symmetry. The dual of a G symmetry is a n minus one symmetry, but not n minus one symmetry. It's a when I say n minus one symmetry, I kind of assume there's a higher group describing that. But this one is beyond the higher group. So this one, the one of invert non invertible symmetry. Actually, this is the simplest non invertible symmetry. That's a dual of ordinary non abelian symmetry. Mm -hmm. It's a non invertible symmetry. And there are symmetries, the symmetry transformation of this non invertible symmetry is generated by the Wilson line operator. And the Wilson line operator, the fusion Wilson line operator is not invertible. So that's it. Yeah. So this, this is the simplest non invertible symmetry. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I have a few. <laughs> question. Uh, so first of all, uh, when you say the SHB of categorical symmetry, you mean that uh, you mean the I mean, condensation of any in one higher high, one higher dimensional theory, is that right? Yeah. Uh, then yeah, exactly. Uh, we describing the when say condensation gave rise right to all these phase gap phase gap phase phase. What, what it really means is a condensation to the boundary. So condensation only in one higher dimension, but to the boundary. Okay. And uh, so, the, so basically, the boundary is determined by the onion condensation. So the pattern of onion condensation gave rise to different boundary. So using that, we we try to study different phase in one lower dimension. So another question is: so in the example of the Z2 gauge theory, I mean in two plus one uh, dimension, uh, so the non-condensability, I mean, or the relation between the condensed variables can be also seen. Uh, as an, an anomaly of one form symmetry is right, which can be matched by, I mean, even one higher dimension. So, uh, is, is there any, any relation between? What, what's, what's your So, the D2 uh, gauge theory. Yeah. Uh, has, uh, two one form symmetries. Yes. Electric and magnetic, and, and they are anomalous, right? Yeah. Uh, and which can be matched as, uh, I mean, one higher, even higher dimensional. Uh, oh, about. okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so is there any relation between this picture and particular? Topic? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, I answer yes. Yeah. Yeah. Is it's, it's, here we say the lower dimension system have a zero symmetry, mm -hmm. but you can, this, this don't have to be zero. So it can be one symmetry, two symmetry, the yeah. same thing. Yeah. And, uh, the, 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 the we will we'll have we we'll have an example of a Z two gauge theory. What is the symmetry of a Z two gauge theory? It's actually a very tricky question. And uh, I try to say that the Z two gauge theory have no symmetry, no one form of symmetry, no symmetry at all. But uh, uh, that's that's the thing. That means uh, at any scale of all the extension, mm -hmm. Z two gauge theory have no symmetry. So their bulk is trivial. Mm -hmm. However. If you assume like a Z2 chart of very high energy, you only have a Z2 flux. Then below the energy gap of Z2 charge, then there's an emergent uh, symmetry. Oh, actually, that's a, that'll be one symmetry. Mm -hmm. Then this emergent symmetry below the energy gap of Z2 charge, then have a non, have non trivial emergent symmetry, then that would have a bulk, non trivial bulk. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, when 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 you say when people say there's a the symmetry in the gauge theory, uh, it's very important to to specify uh, the assumption which excitation you assume to be very heavy, and uh, the, the, then one can make a a, a statement. If uh, if every excitation are uh, interacting in play at the low energy, then the the gauge theory have no symmetry. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So so yeah. So I have another question. So, uh, so categorical symmetry is characterized as, uh, I mean, topological order in one higher, di higher dimension. Yes. But do we know the, I mean, mathematical, I mean, object to, I mean, characterize the topological order in generic dimension? 
like because in higher dimension there will be various kinds of uh, exactly yeah so, it's uh it's difficult and uh, so next Tuesday I'm going to give a talk in IBS and uh, about uh, some attempt to do this uh, three plus one dimension and we have a, a physicist approach and I think uh 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 uh, uh uh, Theo, uh, Johnson, Fiat have this uh, more mathematical approach, more rigorous one, and so so that is attempt to classify topology order in three plus one dimension. And uh, in four plus one dimension, I don't know. Yeah, uh, but certainly they all decurs down to higher category theory. Yeah, and the higher category theory is uh, still actually people mathematics are actively developing that, and uh, there's uh, there's some recent and also fast progress in this area. So, 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 so you can see this uh, physics and mathematics kind of co-developing in this area. Yeah. Yes. So, so one last question. So, uh, so here the I mean other I mean symmetry we consider discrete ones, I guess. And yeah. Do you have some comment on the I mean continuum version? Of yeah, continuous trouble. Yeah, this this approach have trouble to deal with continuous symmetry, mm -hmm. uh, because of the you can say naturally the gauge group for continuous group the bulk is gapless. Then, then we don't have an energy scale separation, and uh, yeah, this holographic picture breaks down. And uh, it's an open question. It's a very important open question, and we wish we have a uh, something to say. And uh, so that's one thing. Certainly, one would uh, consider very actively uh, to do. Uh, from category three point of view, for continuous symmetry, there is infinite number of representation. It means you need to consider category with infinite number of objects. Mm -hmm. And recently, there are some work for U1 symmetry. One try to consider, you know, physicists consider categories within the object. You know, mathematician probably think it's too wild that they want to consider that, but the physicists can do that. <laughs> so there, there's some work. I, I, I think maybe it's doable. You know, it's not, it's not that bad, you know. And, uh, so, uh, 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 I don't feel this fundamental question, but however, there's one important thing. Uh, I feel that for continuous symmetry, this is a holographic picture breakdown. And, uh, so that's the reason we call this a categorical symmetry rather than holographic symmetry or holographic principle or topological holography, something like that. Because for continuous symmetry, this breakdown. Maybe it works even for continuous symmetry, but at the moment, it breaks down. However, uh, however, operator algebra still works. You know, the, the, this a string operator, uh, this algebra works. You still have many, many operators. Mm -hmm. And just that algebra no longer have interpretation of a bulk topology order. Mm -hmm. But the, the algebra, this uh, extended string operator, that algebra still works. So I think that one may be more general, uh, a formulation, uh, for this kind of thing. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so more questions on June? Okay, if not, yeah, let's thank speaker again. Yeah. Thank you.